one of the uh, British Drama League uh, dialect records. This is uh, number 12A, Ulster. And it says, uh, Richard Mantell, Belfast, Standard Passage, uh, The Old Orange Flute, with introduction. So you see, I'm right about that, miss. The wee girl coming from the schoolyard, that passed the bear. Now, there she is, going down the road through the red gate, on the left-hand side of the way. I see. The silly child has gone straight up to the door of the wrong house. Daft youngster, what you thinking about? Just wish you'd very likely chance to find that grumpy, shriveled, deaf old fella. We all know him well enough, don't we? Of the name of Thomas, isn't it? Well, he can't abide the children. Won't the edge of the old boy's tongue soon teach her not to do that again? I'll warrant he's a treasure. Look, isn't it true? See her scuttling off. Poor dear lamb. That's his tune. Sure. Did you ever see such a sight in the world? Here comes the schoolmaster too. Dude, what a shindy. Now, I wonder how many of you are truly concerned with the meaning of the word orange man. Anyway, I will try to explain to you in as few words as possible. On the 12th of July, 1690, William of the House of Orange defeated James II at the Battle of the Boyne, and in so doing, freed the Irish Protestant from the Catholic or Papish yoke. The name Orangeman was adopted by members of a society instituted in Ireland in 795 for the purpose of upholding the Protestant religion on ascendancy and for the discouragement of Catholicism. To this day, the Orange Man yearly celebrates the great victory of 1690 by marching in procession with flute and drum each 12th of July to what is known as the Field. To show you how strongly the Orange Man feels regarding Catholicism, I will now read you an old poem entitled The Old Orange Flute. In the county to Rome, in the town of Dungallon, where many a Russian myself had a hand in, Bob Williamson lived a weaver to trade, and as all of us thought, a stout orange blade. On the 12th of July, as it yearly did come, Bob played on the flute to the sound of the drum. And although you may talk of the harp or the lute, there was nothing could sound like Bob's old orange flute. But this treacherous scoundrel, he took us all in, for he married a papish called Bridget McGinn, and turned papish himself and forsook the old cause that gave us our freedom, religion and laws. Now the boys in the townland made some stir upon it, and Bob had to fly to the proms of Connet. He fled with his wife and his fixings to boot, and along with the rest went the old orange flute. At the chapel on Sunday, to atone for past deeds, he said Peter and Ovi, and counted his beads, till after some time, at the priest's own desire, he went with his old flute to play in the choir. He went with his old flute to play in the mass, and the instrument shivered and said, Oh, alas, and blow as he would, though it made a great noise, the flute would play only the Protestant boys. Bob jumped, humped and started, and got in a splutter, and threw his old flute in the blessed holy water. He thought that this charm would bring some other sound, and he blew it, and then it came, croppies lay down, and all he could whistle, and finger and blow, for to play papish music, the flute would not go. Kick the poke, the boy in water, it always would sound, but one papish squeaking it, could not be found. At a council of priests, that was held the next day, they prepared to administer, auto da fe, for they couldn't knock heresy, out of its hair, and they bought Bob another to play in its stead. So the old flute was doomed, and its fate was pathetic. It was fastened and burned at the stake as heretic. And while the flames roared, they all heard a strange noise. Was the old flute still playing? The Protestant boys.